Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. Will the Ukraine war stem the rising tide of authoritarianism and reignite liberalism around the world? Let's get to the bottom line. In many ways, Ukraine has become not only a proxy fight between the East and the West, but a battle between ideologies. On one hand, there's liberalism and the Enlightenment values, and on the other, authoritarianism. In Ukraine's case, the question is, do states have the right to make their own choices and their own friends? What does it mean if states don't have sovereignty and independence? In Russia's case, do its fears for its national security justify the carnage that we're looking at every day? Will it do anything to prevent Ukraine from joining a Western alliance that makes Russia feel threatened? Does might make right? So what will the global consequences of this war now be? Will authoritarianism everywhere begin to falter? And what happens, on the other hand, if Russia wins? Joining me today is political philosopher Francis Fukuyama, whose book, The End of History and the Last Man, came out in 1992 and argued that Western-style liberal democracy had evolved over all other ideologies. What he didn't say is that other forces wouldn't try and make a comeback. Now he's coming out with a new book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, about the challenges to liberal democracy. How do you see uh, Russia, Ukraine in this moment? Uh, I think that there is a much larger fight going on. Uh, I started going to Ukraine regularly back uh, uh, in 2013. Uh, my center at Stanford runs a number of training programs for hopefully a new generation of Ukrainian leaders. And we did this because all the way back then, you know, beginning with Russia's seizure of Crimea uh, and the Donbass, uh, it seemed to, to me that this was the front line in a global struggle between democracy and authoritarian government. You know, there's two separate issues. You talked about sovereignty, and so there's a general principle that countries shouldn't be invaded by their neighbors, uh, that uh, might doesn't make right, and that people have a right to uh, their living in their own countries. But there's also an issue about uh, liberal democracy. And, you know, to me, the, the second issue is maybe even more important. Uh, I think that, you know, I, I had this feeling, I remember when I was walking through the Maidan, the central square in Kyiv, uh, uh, the last time I was there, just looking at the people walking around the street, it was like a normal Western European city. Uh, people were free. They could criticize the government. They could organize. They could uh, really uh, vote for whoever they wanted. And, and when they voted for President Zelensky, they picked a complete outsider to the kind of corrupt establishment that had been um, very dominant in the country. And so you know, there's uh, some pretty basic values at stake uh, when Russia decided that actually, no, Ukraine is not a sovereign nation. It really uh, belongs to us. And I think what was driving that was that issue of liberal democracy, because Putin had asserted at several points uh, previously that Slavic peoples, that the, the what he calls the greater Russian people, and that includes Ukrainians, are really not suited for democracy, that they like a strong centralized uh, dictatorship. And the Ukrainians were proving him wrong. Uh, if democracy could flourish in Ukraine, it could flourish in his country. And that obviously represented a big uh, threat to his regime. And so I think those are the broader issues that are at stake. It's not just the question of sovereignty. It's also the question of whether uh, you can have a uh, a, a free society in a place like Ukraine and whether other free societies are going to support it. A lot of people have thought that while we were hand-wringing in the West and talking about, you know, democracy's tough days and do we have to fight and struggle for democracy, I don't think anybody there thought the face of that would be Vladimir Zelensky uh, and the Ukrainian people, that fighting for democracy has become very, very tangible, and very bloody. Uh, a very hard fight. And I'd love to know your thoughts, because this, this was framed by Karaganov and others as a fight, not over Ukraine's sovereignty, but over the battle with democracy. Well, I think, that in a way, um, Putin has done all of us a favor by reminding us what the stakes are in, uh, you know, in the issue of democracy. I think that you know, Europe, uh, by and large, has been very fortunate to have lived in uh, 
relative peace and prosperity. I mean, that has been generally true in Western Europe for 75 years since the end of the first, uh, Second World War. Uh, and in Eastern Europe since 1989, 1991, you know, those countries were liberated from uh, communist dictatorship. And you've had a whole uh, generation of people grow up uh, under a, 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 a democratic uh, framework uh, that's connected to the global economy, that's produced prosperity uh, and the like. And I think that, you know, when you're living in that condition, you tend to take it for granted. You think in the abstract, yeah, maybe we need to fight for it, but you don't actually have to fight for it. And all of a sudden, we've got a situation in which people are desperately fighting, uh, you know, for their way of life. And I think it's a very useful uh, and by the way, I mean, I, I think this doesn't justify anything that's happened, um, you know, because the, the suffering in, in Ukraine is just, it's horrible. And it's very, very unfair that, in a way, they're bearing a burden on behalf of all of us. Um, but that being said, I do think that, you know, it's reminded people in the West that they can't take uh, liberal democracy for granted and that the, it does require some struggle. You know, there's a tendency, I think, in the media right now to try to distill this down almost uh, to the point of being a Star Wars script. You know, they are Darth Vader in the Empire. You know, Luke Skywalker and the Jedis are on the white side. But, but there are a lot of folks that don't see it this way. They see America's invasion uh, in response during the Iraq War uh, as something where America was perceived by many around the world to have adopted a might-might-makes-right uh, mentality in some things. They see the United States as a nation that was kind of gravityless in a lot of the decisions it made in the world and didn't always see it as a benign uh, player in global affairs. Are, are there moments of introspection we have to have uh, on the United States side of what we need to do to be greater supporters of the kind of liberalism that we're all talking about today? Well, first of all, what you say is correct. I was just in the Balkans, and there, there's actually a fair amount of support for Putin uh, and a fair amount of cynicism about the European Union and about the West in general, because, you know, a lot of those countries have been trying to get into the EU, and they've been largely uh, blocked in that path. Uh, but, you know, of course, the introspection is uh, necessary and uh, very important. And I do think that the mistakes that have been made in American foreign policy, like the Iraq War, uh, have echoed, you know, through the years in ways that were not anticipated, that have been very damaging uh, to America's image and to the image of democracy. You know, democracy promotion in the eyes of many is synonymous with invasion, and that's, you know, that's a very bad situation. I just think the timing is important. So. That introspection is uh, important, but I don't think that that should get in the way of our doing whatever we can to help protect Ukraine, because that protection really needs to come now. And I think that, um, you know, having these self-doubts uh, at this particular moment is just not the right timing for it. Uh, hopefully, if this Russian assault can be beaten back, then I think it'll be completely appropriate to say, well, we haven't created the kind of world where nobody uses military force, you know, across borders in this particular fashion. I guess I've been asking you, you know, over your long career of looking at Russia, of looking at the Soviet Union, what did we get wrong after 1989 um, that we need to pay attention to after this episode is over? Whatever. You predicted Putin is going to have a bad end and we'll, we'll lose and won't survive that loss. What do we do at that moment so that we don't repeat history again? Yeah, that's a really complicated question. I think there's an internal uh, uh, Russia dimension and a foreign policy dimension. I think in terms of uh, what the advice we were giving Russia as they were trying to make a transition to a market economy, we made a lot of mistakes that we haven't fully owned up to. I think that we kind of assumed at that point that, uh, you know, this is sort of the neoliberal wave that that had, had gripped, you know, a lot of economists at that time, that somehow uh, free markets were the answer to everything and that they would be self-sustaining without uh, 
a political structure of a state that could actually enforce property rights and, and, and the like. And I think we encouraged a uh, too rapid transition to a market economy in a way that impoverished a lot of Russians. Uh, whether we could have you know, reverse that by a Marshall Plan for Russia, I, I don't know, that's a complicated question. But I do think a lot of the economic advice that we were giving at that time uh, was, was really uh, wrong, that the transition should have been much more careful and much more gradual. The foreign policy argument is one that's still echoing, you know, in, uh, in, in people like John Mearsheimer, where, you know, the argument was that we should not have uh, expanded NATO and that Russia might have developed into a kind of normal, you know, maybe somewhat authoritarian, but but not a terribly ambitious country, uh, if we had not pushed NATO right up uh, to its borders, including countries that had been part of the former USSR. That argument, I I don't, you know, it, it's a counterfactual that that nobody's ever going to be able to prove. I just don't believe that that's the case because. Uh, I think that the Eastern European country, first of all, the expansion was not driven by, uh, you know, by the West. It wasn't driven by Washington. It was driven by countries that had a long historical experience of living under uh, Russian power. Uh, and they understood, I think, that once the balance of forces changed and Russia was powerful again, that they would revert to this long-term historical pattern of trying to dominate their neighbors and that they wanted some uh, protection against that. And I think that, you know, if you look at Putin's narrative, he claims that his, uh, the reason for his acting is a kind of short-term threat posed by Ukraine to Russia's security. But if you listen to the other stuff he says about how important it is to reverse the entire democratization of you know, the, the of Eastern Europe that occurred after 1991, you see that the issue is this one of democracy versus authoritarianism. And it really doesn't have to do with Ukraine. It's really trying to restore the former Soviet Union uh, in all of its glory and reversing uh, the, the, the idea of a Europe whole and free that, that we supported at the end of the Cold War. Uh, and I think that that would have happened regardless of whether we had expanded NATO. If we hadn't expanded NATO, then Poland and the Baltic states would be in exactly the same position that, that uh, Ukraine is in today. Uh, so that's my view. I cannot prove that again because it's a counterfactual, but I, I believe that that was not the fundamental mistake that we made. I'd be interested in, in your reflections, not only on the global uh, wave that has hit some of these populist leaders, but also the, what's been happening in the U, U.S. political system and, and how you see the, the, the winners or losers or the shaping of voices from this point forward, you know, in, in, in the U.S. electorate. Well, I think the impact is going to be uh, uh, quite extensive. Um, you know, it's interesting that all of those populist leaders, um, beginning with Donald Trump, as you mentioned, all liked uh, Vladimir Putin. And I think it tells you, <clears throat> tells you something about the nature of this new wave of populism. You know, there's been this argument uh, where a lot of people have said, well, populists are just doing things that are popular, but they're basically democratic. And they're representing a group of people that feels neglected and despised and looked down upon. There's a degree of truth to that, but I think the, uh, the attraction to Putin indicates that there's something else that's much more sinister uh, behind their agendas, which is that they actually don't like liberalism, meaning not the cultural liberalism that we've been fighting about in this country, but liberalism in the sense of a constitutional order that produces a rule of law that restricts the power of executives, of presidents, uh, and prime ministers to just do whatever they want. They like the idea of a strong leader that can just cut through, you know, all of the all of the bureaucracy and, and rules and just do what the people want. Uh, and it's a very dangerous tendency. And I think that's one of the reasons they like Putin. The fact that so many of them are on record um, praising Putin, trying to get photographed with him, like Marine Le Pen, uh, 
uh, or failing to criticize him in any way, like former uh, President Trump. Uh, that's something that, you know, their opponents can hang around their heads the next time they're up for uh, an election. Uh, because I think that the, um, you know, the devastation and the moral clarity that has been produced as a result uh, will reflect on them and will f reflect on the kind of moral people that they are, or in this case, aren't. What sorts of pressures do you think this moment puts on China? I remember reading a piece you wrote years ago that as we had simultaneous wars going on in Afghanistan and Iraq, the United States and the West, um, China was on a charm offensive around the world and taking advantage of that moment. I see China right now, of course, you know, we also saw pictures of Xi Jinping with Vladimir Putin recently. But in, in other ways, if you were kind of looking at it analytically, China's trying to keep its powder dry in some ways. But I'd be interested in what you think they're getting out of this, what impact you see on China and the way it engages um, with the equities it cares about in the world. Well, there's two uh, separate questions with regard to China that we need to think about. So the first is the more short-term one. Uh, do they actually answer Putin's call for assistance? And there, uh, there seems to be increasing evidence that they've decided that they've made a wrong bet uh, and that uh, they don't want to, you know, associate themselves with um, a leader who has become a global pariah uh, they've got a lot of short-term economic interest in not getting caught up in secondary sanctions and the like. I mean, it's not going to be possible to sanction China the way uh, Russia has been sanctioned, but it still will have a, a bad impact. And I do think that there's still this residual desire uh, to be seen as a, you know, a, a good player in global politics. And so it looks like they're uh, trying to back away from, you know, what at the Olympics uh, they had you know, called a, I don't know, whatever it was, a forever friendship. Uh, the more um, crucial thing is a longer term issue about Taiwan, because, you know, as many people have recognized, uh, they want to take back Taiwan. Uh, they have pretty much said that that could happen peacefully, or uh, there might be circumstances in which it might have to happen militarily. Uh, I think that the uh, calculus that they're making on Taiwan is, first of all, obviously the military dimensions of an attack, but, you know, more importantly, what's the response going to be? What's the response from the United States and what's the response from the rest of the world? And I think that if I were a Chinese leader, I would be very careful. Uh, you know, the Russian military did not perform at anything like the level that it was expected to, given all the money that had been poured into new weapons and uh, uh, training. Uh, and I think uh, China will suffer from similar problems. Uh, but more importantly, the kind of resolve of the democracies around the world to resist that has been very surprising. And I think the Chinese are probably taking that into account as well. So I do think it may have you know, some deterrent effect. Can you finally just give us a quick um, glimpse of your new book that's coming out um, uh, soon, Liberalism and Its Discontents? You know, knowing a Frank Fukuyama book, I know that you probably are giving counsel to those of us who believe in the liberal order uh, that we've not been doing our job, that we've been kind of bored at the switch, that there are a lot of things that haven't been, you know, held up. And you kind of see that in the way, uh, even, even the kind of boredom over the uh, uh, you know, the big summit for democracy that Joe Biden had recently. It was kind of a yawn that came and went. So I'd love, I'd love our audience to kind of hear about the book if you give us a quick moment on it. Uh, sure. So I think that um, for many people, especially kind of Gen, Gen Z uh, people that have been born after the Cold War and have a very different experience, uh, liberalism seems like old hat. You know, it seems like something that they're parents' generation or maybe even their grandparents' generation believed in, but it's not appropriate uh, for the moment. Um, you know, that's for many progressives on the left. And I think for people on the right, they they blame liberalism for all the terrible things that they see affecting, uh, you know, let's say American national identity, you know, the attack on religion and disrespect for uh, kind of ordinary Americans who are patriotic and hardworking and so forth. Um, and there's been a lot of debate about the rights and wrongs of all of these different criticisms. But 
in the process, you know, it seems to me that nobody's gotten up and said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm an old fashioned liberal and I'm proud of it. And I think that there's a lot of intrinsic reasons why liberalism is the best political system and that none of these uh, criticisms that have been made ultimately are, are decisive. So that's why I decided to write this book. I mean, it deals with all the criticisms and explains why I don't think they're correct. But it's also an attempt to explain, you know, why liberalism exists, why it's a good thing, why you should be very grateful for living in a liberal society as opposed to either a kind of nationalist or, uh, you know, a more traditional kind of um, uh, uh, authoritarian country and why, you know, some of the ideas on the left for replacing liberalism with, you know, some form of identity based politics is also not a good idea. Uh, so that's really the purpose in, in, in writing this to say, you know, say it now and say it loud. I'm a liberal and I'm proud. Let me ask you one last question. President Zelensky is speaking to parliaments all over the world. They're remarkable speeches to the Canadian Parliament, to the U.S. Congress, now to the European Parliament. And he's asking for more. He's asking for help. He's asking for uh, uh, military supplies, uh, airplanes, no-fly zones. Is America doing enough from your perspective? Is Joe Biden doing enough? Uh, to give Zelensky what he needs. Yeah, the no-fly zone issue is a really difficult one, uh, and one that my, you know, I have not been in favor of that, and that's something that's upset a lot of my Ukrainian friends. Uh, I think that there's a kind of technical issue that many people don't understand, which is that if you were to uh, uh, impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine, you would have to attack Russian targets in Russian territory, because a lot of the threats, uh, you know, the rockets that are raining down on Kharkiv and Kyiv and other Ukrainian cities are coming from Russian territory. And you can't really protect Ukraine without actually uh, attacking Russia. And for NATO to uh, start that kind of attack, I think, is a very grave step. Uh, it may be necessary at some point, but I think that we haven't reached that 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 moment yet. Uh, and so I think that, you know, what we need to do is to accelerate what we've been doing, which is to pro provide them with, you know, the maximum amount of usable ground-based air defense systems, you know, like S-300s uh, uh, that uh, can be used in the short run to protect uh, Ukrainian cities. Uh, but to not go, you know, to the next stage of escalation, because I just think the the scenarios that could unfold from that are really pretty uh, numerous and pretty scary. Well, Francis Fukuyama, author and senior fellow at Stanford University, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Steve. So what's the bottom line? Sometimes history goes to sleep. Francis Fukuyama wrote about the end of history 30 years ago when the Soviet Union fell apart. Now he says history is waking up. We're being reminded of what the stakes are if might makes right becomes the rationale for any country's behavior, as America did in the Iraq War, and bandying about populist slogans like America First, which really means an America that doesn't care about the rest of the world. Populist leaders don't like liberalism. They don't like the give and take of a democracy where both political winners and losers actually believe in the rights of each other. But as graphic and disturbing as the image of Ukraine atrocities are, maybe Fukuyama is right. They are igniting the spirit and the purpose of those who believe in justice, in liberalism, democracy, and sovereignty. History is awake again. And that's the bottom line.